Thank you. I was glad that Kevin mentioned Beethoven's inappropriate note. In my domain, the, the domain of language, we're search, searching all the time for the inappropriate word. The perfect word is not necessarily the inappropriate word. But to do that takes time. It takes a lot of time. When I was starting out as a writer, time was the one thing I, I did not have enough of. I had a young family. I was working full time as a carpenter. I, I worked as a carpenter for five years after college and found that I had about an hour a day to write. And I, I was able to write a book that way and a, f and a few essays, but it wasn't enough. To, to reach that zone where time disappears, where it seems like you have all the time in the world, which is necessary if you're going to give so much attention to every word, is, dis is the difficult part of my profession. And that's where the blind leap came in. But of course, it isn't really blind. You have to prepare. A musician has to learn the music. A writer has to read everything. But it is a leap, and it's risky. You risk humiliation. You risk criticism. You risk bankruptcy. You risk failure. I'll give you an example of humiliation, at least. One of the um, privileges of my profession is that when a new book comes out, the, the publisher sends you on a book tour. And I have many, many book tour stories, as every author does. But one stands out in my mind. It was in 1997, and I had just published a book of personal essays about, about largely about fishing, but also about nature. And it was a very personal book and um, was very risky in itself, because before that, I had written primarily natural history and reportage journalism. So this book came out, and I didn't know what kind of reception I would get, and I, I felt quite flayed when I went out in pu into public and read from the book and talked about it. Well, before I started getting much um, feedback, I, I was on tour and I was in Minneapolis. We were at a Borders store. And they had the terrific idea to have a raffle. They raffled a fly rod and reel, which was a, was a terrific idea, I thought, and it was very generous of them, and advertised it widely and for weeks ahead of time. I, I did the sign or did the appearance on a Friday evening uh, in a beautiful weather in beautiful weather, which I always figure is the, a good excuse for what happened. Um, seven o'clock on Friday night when it's 70 degrees out and sunny, six people showed up, and they had chairs arranged in the store room for a hundred, and there were six. And I started um, talking about the book and reading from it, which is is what you do in those situations. And I, I could sense from the audience right away that, wait, something's wrong. And then, of course, it hit me. I said, well, they're here for the fly ride. <laughs> so, so I said, OK. I cut it short. I said, let's have the raffle. And, and the young lady at the, from, who worked at the bookstore brought up a, a bowl with the six names in it. And I reached in, and I pulled it out. And it's actually the, the name of the guy I was hoping would win. He was a teenager, young guy, he was sitting right in the front and he was really excited. And he leaped to his feet and run, ran up and got the rod and hugged the young lady and left. <laughs> and immediately, four of the remaining five people got up and left. <laughs> the one that remained was sitting in the back and he was grinning at me. And he was a young, youngish man, maybe 30, 35, dressed in a business suit. And he got up and he started walking toward me and he stumbled and he fell. And he looked up from the floor and he was drunk. He was really drunk, he was hammered. And he said, <laughs> he said, I'm a big fan. <laughs> I spend my time alone. I work alone in a, in, a, in a stone building on our property on Old Mission Peninsula. My friend Keith Taylor at the University of Michigan laughs that I have a view out my window he calls the million dollar view of East Bay, but that I keep it curtained, the curtains closed because I need to be isolated. I need to be em embraced in space and time so that I can do the work I do. And I do that day after day. But what I keep thinking about is a, a an experience I had three years ago as a teacher. I don't teach much. I, I teach primarily only at the Univers University of Michigan's Writers' Conference called the Bear Lake Conference on Walloon Lake. I've been, I'm a faculty member there. I've been with them since their beginning about 10 years ago. 
Three years ago, I had a student in my workshop who was a high school student named Anthony, about six foot, three inch, gangly, awkward, pimple ravaged, ter terrified young man who sat in the workshop and, and hardly would talk. He would hardly w look up. He was so shy and he was so much in pain. And I worked with him as much as I could. We all did. We all took him under our wings and we, we urged him, come on, you know, come on, work at it. Let's go. Let's try it. Show us what you got. Gradually, he started to open up. After four days, he was starting to show us what he had and he had a lot. This was a kid with a real gift for poetry. He was in my workshop on nonfiction because he was interested in nature imagery. And he was saying, how can I bring nature into my po poetry? And we worked very closely with that. Well, the last night of the conference is the time when the attendees get to show their stuff. They get to read their weekend's output, anything they want, to the whole, the whole group, which is usually around 120 people. When it was Anthony's turn, he got up and he read a poem that was hands down the, the most powerful treatment I've ever heard of what it's like to be a teenager. It was called Ninth Grade Football. And it was in a rap format, and he rapped it. And it brought down the house. People were pounding their feet on the floors. They were jumping in the air and applauding, gave him a standing ovation. And I went up to him afterwards to congratulate him, and he hugged me. And he was practically in tears. He was ripped wide open. He was as raw as a newborn. And he said, I don't know how anything works. And I said, Anthony, nobody does. He said, I don't know how I wrote a poem, let alone how I could ever write a book. How do you write a book? How did you get to where you're writing books? So I had a short answer and a long answer for him. The long answer I've been working on ever since. The short answer was I talked to him about risk and about taking the leap in, in every sense of that word, the creative leap. The, the physical leap out of your ordinary life into a life of danger and of creativity. I told him the story about when I was his age and wanted to be a writer, but had no idea how to start and, and no idea if it was even possible. I grew up in Traverse City, and we, in those days, we rarely had visiting authors, and when we did, they were usually local, local writers, historians and poets primarily. So I started reading everything I could get. I was so enchanted with books, that was the fun part. But I wanted to know, I wanted to know more all the time. I went to college, studied English. I, I flunked out of a couple of colleges because I, my passion was also for the outdoors. And I made the mistake of going to college first here at NMC, where there are too many distractions. And then at Northern in Marquette, where there are even more distractions. And while there, I was married, and my wife and I lived in a house with a, 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 a guy downstairs named Craig Date, who became a very close friend. We spent all our time together out, outside, fishing, canoeing, skiing, hiking, camping. And we used to talk about how cool it would be to write a book together. He was just as enchanted and, and enchanted with books as I was. And we said, wow, we should figure out a way that we can do this. And by this, we meant canoeing, fishing, camping, and hiking, and get paid for it. And wouldn't it be great to write a book? Well, five years later, we decided to collaborate on a book. And we sat down, and by this time, I knew how to write a book proposal. And I wrote a really kick-ass proposal. And I described us as a freelance writer-photographer team, which was pretty much a lie. We had no experience. I, I had at that point published a couple of essays in local and state publications. Craig was the photographer, but he had never taken a professional photograph and in fact didn't own a camera. <laughs> and we got a letter back from the publisher saying, we love your idea. We love this book. Let's go for it. Let's do it. The contract is forthcoming. So we jumped into it. We thought it would take six months. It took two years. Two and a half years later, we're sitting at my wife Gail's in my house on 11th Street at the kitchen table. The book, Canoeing Michigan Rivers, is out, and it's selling. It sold a couple thousand copies that year, and it's sold a couple thousand copies every year since. And we're talking about the future. I said, how can I write full time? I'm making my living as a carpenter. I'm exhausted. I, I haven't got enough time. What can we do? 
And Craig says, quit. And well, it was easy for him to talk, I figured, because he's a single guy and he, he's free. And I said, well, I've got a family to support. My wife is a graphic designer. She just graduated from college and she had a couple small clients, but together we're making just enough to pay the bills every month, no extra at all. And he said, all the more reason to quit. And I said, <laughs> Gail's pregnant. We have a seven-year-old son and she's pregnant with our second. She's seven months pregnant. And he goes, all the more reason to quit. And I said, we have no money. We're broke. He said, all the reason to, more reason to quit. You're going to be broke anyway. Might as well be doing something you love. I looked at Gail and she threw up her arms and she said, quit. <laughs> so I did the next day. And after that, it was like weights coming off a runner's legs. I, I was off and running. The risk of it the, was a form of terror, and it kept me at it. It kept me up every morning, got me up every morning, and kept me working. It kept me rewriting when I failed, and working harder and harder. I set goals for myself: 50 articles, essays, and stories a year, and a book every two years. A pace I kept up for a decade. I had a day soon after I started where I wrote an essay, two short stories, and 24 poems in one day and later published one of the essays and one of the stories and none of the poems. But it was enough to, to keep us going for a month. It went on like this. I, I told Anthony all this because I wanted him to see that it is possible, that you can take the leap and you can risk everything. And really when it comes down to it, you're not risking anything. We're all at risk all the time. We're at peril. So I'd like to close by reading the part that I did right that I've been working on ever since for Anthony. A little bit of it at least. He's, his question, how do I write a book? This is my answer. Make it a box of surprises. Make the first page a joyous bounce into the razor sharp bayonets of the second page and the lioness swinging by her tail on the third page and the roaring forest fire on the fourth. Open it at random and out tumble ivory buttons, fossil brachiopods, a, flocks of, a flock of starlings, and the scent of rain. Avoid familiar clusters of words. Find the poem in the paragraph, the jewel in the slag, the vault hidden in the center of the mountain. Insert the ache that steals your sleep. Include the longing that is like an itch. Don't hold back. Put it all on the line. Everything you know, everything you've experienced. Your life is at stake. Make it flow, tumble, roar, rush, meander, funnel, flood, explode. Make it immediate and keep it moving. Beware of back eddies, flashbacks, lengthy explanations, gratuitous commentary, pointless yakety yak, pretentious posturing, pompous pronouncements, self-aggrandizements of any kind. Avoid all dams and diversion canals that might halt flow. First you need an idea, which is really a feeling, which builds into a vision. Then you need opportunity, time, focus, drive, concentrated attention, courage, and confidence. Most of those qualities you prepare for yourself. Confidence you are born with or earned through experience. Figure it out. Be hungry for it. Hungry, with physical craving, a gut ache in the prefrontal cortex. Go deep into engagement and immersion. When you do, strange things happen. You sense currents like those swirling in the ocean's deep canyons. You become intuitive. You taste the flavor in moments, catch the scent of time. Everything becomes precious. Every moment turns luminous. Be courageous. A million voices, a billion voices will cry out that you have to do what they do. Nothing new, nothing daring, nothing that threatens, undermines, indicts, or diminishes the certain, familiar, safe. It's not enough to be bold. You have to be indomitable. You have to be a fucking warrior. Ignorance helps of the odds against success, of how much work it is, of how little time we have. But mainly, you just have to take the leap. Thank you.